amazing this time. <laughs> okay. Let's keep going. Come on, John. Um, all right, brother. Come on. Okay, turning from problems to Christ. Let's talk about this one second. Come on. Um, okay, problem focus. The person comes over to my house with a problem. He's so focused on the problem, it actually starts to affect him negatively emotionally. Yeah. And although he probably has 10 great things going on in his life right now that he could just fall down on his knees and say, hallelujah, he can see only that problem. And then my questions tend to focus him even more on his problem. <laughs> Tell me about your problem. <laughs> Where did that problem come from? Why do you think you have that problem? How long have you had that problem? So I have, I have now effectively dug his hole deeper for you. Um, I want to get to the root of that problem. You know, the root probably goes back to Adam and Eve, so what's the point? So why, you know? And I think it happens because, you know, you know, when your car doesn't work, you look for what's broken, right? Or, you know, your, your, your side hurts, so you look for what is it? And, and there's, a, there's an actual answer for that. It's the carburetor, or it's your appendix. But in Christianity, um, it's really not that way. It, it's not, there's not a problem. Um, there's a lack of focus on Christ. Uh, so I need to focus on Christ. Uh, so problem talk, what's wrong with you? What's your problem? Why are you doing so badly? What's the cause of your difficulty? Whose fault is it? Oh, that's always a fun discussion. Uh, <laughs> what are the other things that make it so hard? How do you feel when you, you've been treated that way? So, okay. As it's been excellently illustrated over the years, you know, remember the study where it's like, okay, if you're in sin, you turn away from the sin and turn to God. You don't stay focused on the sin. You, you turn to God. Um, Christ focus. Uh, what could God do? Mm, come on. That's a good question. What could prayer change? Uh, Jesus, always ready to meet your needs. Uh, what could you see happen with God? What have you already done in the past with God that helped you change that? What are your gifts? When has God blessed you? What does your small group most appreciate about you? What does the Bible promise about this situation? What miracles have you seen? When has it been better? Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal. The goal is to be like Christ. To win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Right? Christ-focused leadership. Guide the, guide the disciple with skillfully using different questions. Stay true to God's plan of faith, hope, and love. The goal of discipling is to suggest the possibility of life without the problem. Life without the sin equals Jesus' life, right? Yeah. Right. So if I have a problem today... There's an actual example of someone who lived on this planet without that problem. His yeah. name's Jesus. Okay. <laughs> so I don't need to focus on my problem or even where it came from. I need to focus on Christ and how he lived without it. Come right. On. Amen. And then the disciple takes responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. This is my problem. Okay, Sean. How did Jesus live without that problem? What did he hold on to? What do you think it was about Jesus' life that allowed him to live without it? So what does that look like for you? I'm not going to tell. He has to figure it out. And when he does, next time he has a problem, he won't call you. He'll think about Christ. He'll start studying his Bible. He'll start meditating on how Jesus would have done it. The disciples walk with God. Number one, help the disciple figure out what God wants and what he wants. I really want to change my prayer life right now. Let's say that's what I really want. I, I really want to grow my prayer life. Okay, excellent. Why do you think that's an important thing? Can you show me from the Bible why you think that's an important thing? Obviously, we know it's an important thing. 
But sometimes disciples want things that you're going to have a hard time showing me in the Bible God wants that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Anytime someone says, I really want to do this, I say, you know, what scriptures inspire right. you that, that, that you should want that, that that's possible, that, that that can be done, that that's important. Then they look at the verses and they find them and they get inspired. The Bible says that they can have that. Right? I mean, we, we want to, to guide them to do that. Look for what God has already placed in the disciples' life that is working and encourage them to do more of that. Things that are not working, don't do it anymore. Have you ever had a talk with someone? Have you ever had a talk with someone who's not having good quiet time? Do you say, this is what you do? And you tell them how you do it. And then they do it for a day, maybe two days, and then it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because it's not them. Yeah. Right. Andy Fleming is awesome. I love Andy. And there's so many things I learned from him. But there's certain things that I'm just not Andy. And Andy's not me. And now I have the, the honor of working uh, closely with Douglas and with Wyndham and Valder. There's amazing guys, but they have very different gift sets than I do, a very different temperament. I, I can't be Doug, and I can't be Val, and I can't be Wyndham. I want to grow and be more like them, but there's certain things about them that are just them, and it's just not. I want to imitate their faith, but I'm never going to be them. Come on, bro. But I can have as much faith as they do. And I think we have to help the Christians connect with that. And we'll talk about how to do that. Christ-focused leadership. It's in agreement with the Spirit's intention when he focuses on strengths or sections of the problem. Creating a vision of life without the problem. You know, it's interesting. Everyone who, well, let, let me, I'll, I'll explain this in a minute. The, the Christ-focused leadership per purpose is to help the disciple get unstuck and back on track with the Lord. All the problems are viewed from within the context of the ongoing work of the Spirit. Can I create a vision of life without the problem? If I woke up this morning and really connected with God the way I dreamed to, what would change in my life? What would be different? And we'll, we'll do a practical application. It's, it's so simple to, to talk with Christians like this. And then they, they rely on the scriptures and visualizing how Jesus would have done it in their place. Yeah, come on. Or with them. Amen. Because Jesus is always with us to the very end of the age. Amen. We just don't actually think that. Mm -hmm. Or we think it, but we don't always realize That's it. Right. Right. Come on. We don't apply it. Right. <clears throat> if I asked everyone here to look around and find five red objects... And then I ask you to close your eyes, and then I say, tell me where you saw five blue objects. You probably would not know where they are. Why? Because I asked you to look for red objects. If you focus on problems, you will find problems. If you focused on Christ, you will start to see Christ in everything. Right. Right? Yeah. And there's been studies. I know you've, you've heard different stories like that where there was one in Stanford where they took eight absolutely normal people and put them into a, a psychiatric mental hospital thing. And uh, they committed all eight of them. Uh, people were in there for like, I don't know, from 10 to like 55 days. 2,100 pills were given to them all together. Oh. And they were all eight absolutely normal people. But they went in there and people assumed they had a problem, so they tried to treat the problem. And even if they said they don't have a problem, they said, oh, he's in denial. His problem is he doesn't see his problems, so let's give him some more pills. So, so when the experiment was done, when they were all out, they went back to the, this Stanford uh, medical health thing and said, you know, just so you know, actually all these people were normal. And we want you to know that over the next four months, we're actually going to send in more people that are normal just to see if you can figure it out. Over the next six months, they kicked 41 people out that tried to get admitted, and they actually never repeated the experiment. <laughs> they never sent another normal person in, but now they're looking for people that, and they started kicking, whatever you look for, you find. That's the point I'm trying to make. If you look at this, if you look at the disciple and you just see the Holy Spirit, the scriptures, the life of Christ, 
You just refuse to see anything but what God has actually put in there. That's truth. The old is gone, the new has come. Is that true or not? Yeah. If it's true, then the old's gone, the new is here. Right. Focus on that. Because if you decide to focus on the problems, you'll, you'll find the problems. Because yeah. they're there. You find what you look for. Oh, that's the actual experiment. I didn't know if I actually, I didn't know if I actually had it in the notes. Pretty good. Um, let me give you an illustration from the Old Testament. Come on, brother. 1 Samuel 17, 32, 37. Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him, Paul replied. You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. Discipling from his perspective. Come on, bro. Because for Saul, he can't. So he's going to give advice that connects with him. Right? He's not worried about what David can do with God. He's saying what he could do. On, Obviously, he can't do it. Right? You can't go out and fight that Philistine, but you're only a boy. And he's been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he's defied the armies of the living God, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Let's talk about this a second. Come on. The grace event, right? So here we have David. He's a shepherd. He's got sheep. A lion shows up. That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a problem. That goes in category. We have a problem. Right? <laughs> the lion's here, and he's taking one of the sheep. Now, if they had cell phones and David could call me Sean, what do I do? Dude, <laughs> let him go. <laughs> it's just one. That's not a big loss. It's better that you stay alive to protect the other sheep. And I'd give him that advice with full confidence. But that is not who David is. That's not his walk with God. That's not his faith. That's not his gift set. That's not what God put into him. It's a unique person who has his relationship with God. So I would have taken David off course, but luckily there were no cell phones. And David said, over my dead body, he goes after a lion, strikes him, and kills him. Now in theory, there could be two possible Davids. There's the one that heard my advice, saved himself, <laughs> saved the sheep, and he's good. Life is good. Life goes on. Then there's the other David who killed the lion. Now the next situation comes up in his life because yeah. situations tend to repeat themselves. That's right. yeah. Yeah. One David, huh. now a bear comes. What does the one David do? He goes after the bear, strikes him, and kills him. Now the other David who, who had the cell phone that called me, he let the bear have a sheep, and <coughs> but he saved the rest of the sheep. Two different Davids. I'm not judging one or the other. I'm just saying there'd be two different Davids based on me trying to guide them. Yeah. So the bear was another huge problem. We have two different Davids, but then a third huge problem comes up. There's a Goliath. Right. Yeah. The David who received the call from me or who got discipling from Saul, you can't do that. You can't take on this guy. This guy is impossible to take on. But David, the one who took the lion and the bear, said, no, wait a minute. I can remember when God did this in the past. I can recall yeah. moments when God worked. Oh, well. And I will not reference, I will not look at this problem right now. Yeah. I will look at what God's done yeah. and what God promises he can do. Yeah. And that's going to be how I view my, I don't view my problem by how big is Goliath or what weapons he has. You don't need to analyze the problem. Yeah. Right. What you need is understanding of what God has done in your life and what God wants to do in your life. Right. Then based on that, he takes on Goliath. And you know, Saul tries to talk him out of it. He can't be talked out of it. David has great faith. And then Saul tries to tell him how to do it mechanically. Take my sword, take my shield. He's like, dude, I got this. Exactly. All I need is a sling and a stone. See, not everyone's going to do it the same way as me and you. But so often I go into great detail of how the shield and the sword should be this is how you do it. This is how you read your Bible. This is how you pray. This is how you need to go and share. It's all about my technique. Wow. But it's not necessarily going to work that way for them. Nope. They're different than I am. Nope. Right? So I don't have to come up with the answers, actually. Once again, that sets me free. 
They have the answers in them. I need to help them find their, their lion and their bear. And the great thing about disciples is they've all had their lion and bear. There was a moment when they made a decision to be a disciple. Yeah. There's a moment when they made radical changes to their life. There's a moment when they received the Holy Spirit. There was a moment of great joy in their life. But if David, at this moment with Goliath, if he would have forgotten about the bear and the lion, he would have not taken on Goliath. He referenced those victories to take on the next battle in his life. He's not focused on the problem. He's focused on what God can do. Great stuff. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. yes. So there's two options for David here. The one that protect himself went off, got married, had kids, has sheep, and he's living a great life, but it's just not the life God could have given him. <laughs> right. No one gets stuck. No one gets stuck. God is too awesome, too powerful, and the disciple is too amazing for anyone to stay stuck. You just can't explain it if you look at the scriptures. The only reason half my church stays stuck for long periods of time is because I've accepted that's just the way it's going to be. I got my 10% that are my workhorses. They help me take care of the, the, the 20%. On, and, and there's always 50% that's just kind of there. And then there's 10 that's always kind of the, you know, they, they may fall away. We need to take care of them. But the potential of the Church of Christ, the greatest organization ever in the history of the world, is that every single member can connect to the power of Christ. I have to be relentless in my faith that God can use them to do anything. They're not too young. They're not too scrawny. Nope. They're not too on, this. Bro. They're not too that. God can do anything through them. That's right. Amen? Amen. 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 The servants of the man of God. Oh, did I even read that? Or did I get distracted? Yeah. The whole measure of Christ, the fullness of Christ. No one gets stuck. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked, don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Amen. And Elijah prayed, Oh Lord, open his eyes so he can see. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he could look and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Amen. He just couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. Wow. If for five seconds the, the ceiling was rolled back mm -hmm. and you could go into heaven just for five seconds yeah. oh boy. <clears throat> and you came back down here, you would never be the same. And if just for five seconds we could roll up the floor and go down into hell for five seconds and come out, you would never be the same. If Jesus could walk through that door right now and say, I've decided to join the ACR region. Move it. it would never be the same. And I, over the last six months, I've gotten with Christians who want to get a divorce. I've gotten Christians who want to fall away. And if I can just get them with Jesus, Come on. if I can literally, okay, you woke up in the morning and sitting on the end of your bed is Jesus. Tell me what happens next. Then what do the two of you do? And then what do you do? And then what do you do? And it's his story. Yeah. It's what he would do. But if Jesus is right there with him, are you serious? Yeah. Is there any limit to what could happen in that guy's day? If Christ was literally walking physically right next to him? So I'll sit down with a Christian who wants a divorce or who wants that or wants that or wants that and we're just going to spend a little time with Jesus. That's great. Can you Come not on, get a vision for what could happen? Yeah. Come, on. Come on. That's great. Your ministry stuck. What if, what if he just moved in for a day? What would you do together? Tell me about your day. What's the vision? And then it's not about my experience or what I would do or let me tell you how to do this. But people create their story with Christ based on how God has created them. Yeah. According to their faith. Because lots of people could do lots of things, but Jesus always asks the question, right? 
What do you want me to do for you? He didn't tell him. Even when it's guys got no eyes. What do you want? Really? But people have to make up their mind what they want. Right. They've got to decide for themselves what they really want, and then it's God can do it. I've got to quit telling everyone what they want and what they should want and what they should do. Do you not know? Let's look at the Bible on this topic. Let's connect them with God and see what the... There, there's no limit to what God can do. Amen? Amen. You know, it's, it's funny. Someone came to me, oh, she, Part three, part four, then back part three, part four, part three, part two, and you think, wow, did I miss something? Did I fall asleep? Okay, um, this might actually be... Uh, no, we'll, we'll go through this real quick, and then we'll stop because it's dinner time, right? Some new skills. Come on. We're going to move into a little bit of the practical piece to this, okay? Some new skills. This is what I would call them. Leading from one step behind, being a guide to grace, be an encourager. You don't know. That's the toughest one usually for us. An expert listener, empathy. Yeah. Leading from one step behind. Hold on, I have some notes. I want to make sure I don't. Oh, Sean. Great. Great stuff, bro. Okay. You know, the, the great thing about um, some of the discussions I've had with people doing this, I don't actually have to do anything. They have to do the work. What's the problem? I. I I'm stuck spiritually. I, I got with a minister who, who leading a region in Kiev, and he said, I just feel so flat and so stuck. He said, I don't even, I can't even find the energy to want to. So I think, okay, lion and bear. When was there a time that you felt like you weren't stuck? Come on. Tell me the last time you didn't feel stuck, that you actually felt zealous and fired up. Mm -hmm. He said, well, it was probably a month ago. I said, what was going on? Well, I was, I was having quiet times outside. Okay. When was the last time you had a quiet time outside? He said, well, a couple months ago. I said, so, so tell me about that quiet time. How'd you do it? What did you do? What verses from the Bible inspire you to do this? Why do you think that's important to God? Why do you think that clicked with you emotionally? And he's going on and on and on. I said, okay. Tell me then. So let, let Ephesians 3. God can do more than you can ask or imagine. Tell me your day tomorrow. Imagine you wake up and Christ is with you. In the morning, you wake up, you roll over, and he's sitting there. <laughs> Tell me, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'll, I'll get out of bed right away. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> Then what are you going to do? And he said, well, I won't flip on the news and read about what's going on in the Ukraine. I'll probably um, go and pray. I said, okay, what, what else would you do? He said, well, I'd probably want to go outside. I'll go for a walk. I said, well, that's, that's awesome. What time would you need to get up to make all that happen? He said, well, I'd probably have to get up at 6. And I said, okay, excellent. I said, when was the last time you got up at 6? Said about a month ago. <laughs> I said, I said, well, what time are you going to bed? And he said, well, this time. I said, well, what do you think you need to do to get up at six? I'm not telling him anything. So, well, I probably need to go to bed earlier. And I said, all right. So you'll go to bed earlier. You get up at six. You go with Jesus out, and you're going to pray. And I said, when you come home after that prayer, what do you think will be different about your morning? He said, I'll probably wake up my kids with joy in my heart. I said, what do you think your kids will notice? And he said, I'll probably be less agitated. I said, what do you think your wife will notice? He said, she'll be totally fired up. You know, she would notice that I'm giving her a hug in the morning instead of being short. And he starts going through this. So then tell me, what, what staff meeting going to be like after you've had an incredible prayer time? He said, I'll probably have good news to share. I haven't shared good news in a while. I said, what else? He said, well, I'd... I'd, I'd be more excited, more fired up. And I said, what do you think will happen during the day? He said, well, in the past, I used to pray about situations and God would fix them before I even had to meet with them. Yeah. And I think if I was praying a lot more, God would just start blessing situations. Yeah. Right. 
And he said, usually, lately I've been sharing my faith and I just don't even believe something's going to happen. If I had a great prayer time, I'd probably believe I'd be meeting open people. And he starts listing all these things that are just going to be different. Yeah. And, and I'm seeing the change on his face. Because he lacked motivation just to do what he knew what to do. Right. Right. But once he starts really thinking through what's different in his day, he's like, I just need to repent. <laughs> I just need to get out of bed and go pray and start my day with God much stronger. My entire day would be different. And he, and, he, and he did that, and about five days later, he calls me and he said, he's sharing about people he's studying the Bible with, things that have changed. I didn't tell him a single idea. I helped him find the lion and the bear. He said this was his problem. That may not even be his problem. I don't have to be the expert. If that's not it, trust me, we'll find it later. Connected him with the scriptures and the lion and the bear and made it simple. What would you do if Jesus was with you? What would be different? And it changed his perspective. But I'm leading him from one step behind him. I'm not, in, I'm not telling him what to do because I'm different than him. Yeah. Amen. I don't like to go outside to pray. I like to turn on my hair dryer in the bathroom and get on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever, man. Whatever. Because <laughs> it's always cold. And it makes so much noise, I don't hear anything. Yeah. And I can really focus. I love it. It's my favorite place. <laughs> now, that's not going to work for the majority of the Christians. And I'm actually a little bashful to even say that out loud. <laughs> if you have sincerely told many Christians your very best experience of how to fix something and it didn't work for them, don't take it personally. They are not you. Lead from one step behind. Let, and when it's their idea, they own it. A guide to grace, pointing out all the past victories. Oh, I'm ruthless with this. Tell me when it was good. Tell me another time when it was good. How'd you do that? What scriptures fired you up about that? Tell me another one. Tell me another one. Tell me. I make them for 20 minutes. Tell me all the victories of their life. Then it's like, this uncircumcised problem you have now is, is nothing for God. <laughs> After you've talked about the lion and the bear and you, and you revel in how God worked through you to the lion and bear, it wasn't you, it was God. Right. Is this really going to be a problem for God? Wow. You've got to be an awesome guide to grace. God has put so many amazing stories in the Christian's life, they just forget them. Yeah. Yeah. And they get stuck on a problem. Be an amazing encourager. Come on. You can never encourage somebody too much. You just can't. My best tennis matches were in front of lots of people. I just do better when I'm being encouraged. We love our birthday. started with this <laughs> you know it's, it's so funny have you ever tried to encourage a disciple and you look at me think they're not believing a word I'm saying yeah. have you ever seen people that don't actually enjoy their birthday because they know people are going to share about them and they feel yeah. uncomfortable yes. <laughs> if God could list all the things he loves about you wow. it'd be an endless list if Satan could list all the things he thinks you do wrong yeah. and all your weaknesses and all your failures, the list would be long. Yeah. We just had to, you know, we're fighting on God's side. Right. Right. That's right. If someone's thoroughly encouraged, they're going to go do great things. Yeah. If someone's not encouraged, no challenge will get them to do it with faith. Yeah. I always joke that every day needs to be our birthday in Christianity. Because when I go to church and I know it's someone's birthday, I kind of stop. I pull them aside and say, I just really appreciate you. You're awesome. I love you. You're so faithful. You're so good-hearted. And then the next day, it's like, 
dude, where's this? Where's that? Where's this? this, this. But on his birthday, I'm encouraging. <laughs> what if every day, every Christian I saw, I thought, you know what? The first 20 seconds, I'm going to treat him like it's his birthday. I'm just going to tell him how much I thoroughly appreciate Come on, bro. Come this. Come on. Wow. And how much I see God just working in his life. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible wow. yeah. Amen. that out of the 7 billion people on this planet, you're here, you're making a difference, you care. Yeah. And you pump that into your fellowship where every single Christian is saying yeah. that to every single Christian. Come on, come on. Yeah. No one would miss a church service. Yeah. I don't miss my birthday party. I'm there. But if people know they're going to come and there's going to be judgment. And you know what? I'll take any challenge in the world if I know someone's believing in me. I actually enjoy the challenge because it means you also believe in me. But we got to be awesome at encouraging. Just phenomenal encouragers. You don't know. That's the because if you do know, they're going to depend on you the next time. Right. Right. You're going to help them know. You're going to ask them to look at the Bible. You're going to ask them to look at their past. You're going to ask them to explain step by step what in the past they did to make that work. And if they look at the past and they think, it's always bad. It's never been good. I've never had a victory in this. Since the day I was baptized, even before I was baptized, to this day, I'm terrible at this. Okay, so there's no lion and bear. But what's possible if Jesus joins you? Then this whole new can of ideas can open up. Because Christ could do anything. So between the lion and the bear looking in the past for grace, or to Jesus is with us till the end of the age, we find confidence and faith that God can do anything. But you don't know the answer. So you have to ask questions instead of telling people. God and Jesus were very good at this. Jesus asked a lot of questions. You think he didn't know? He knew. God was walking in the cool breeze. Where are you? you think he doesn't know? <laughs> Did you eat from the tree? He told you not to. There's this, there's this question. Let we have to be expert listeners. Because you got to catch the victories. you got to catch the moments of grace. Yeah. Oh, so you got up early and you went, how did you do that? How did you know to do that? And, and help them see that they're capable of making decisions and that it brings fruit in their life. Mm -hmm. And then empathy. Mm -hmm. Giving our heart to people. Mm -hmm. So that's it. And then we can practice it. We can try practicing it with some. We can do that after dinner. Wow. Awesome. Amen. So, Amen. so maybe. Yeah. Yeah.